I'm Dawn Cavanaugh, APQS National Education Director. You know, when the quilting is all done, the last step is to get that binding on the quilt. And I found that it's kind of hard to make the beginning and the ending binding sections look like the rest of the quilt. Well, after 20 years as a long arm quilter, I've learned some secrets to make that really painless and simple and to make it look like there is no beginning or end to your binding. It also helps avoid that lump that you can get if you happen to tuck one inside the other just as a, a quick way to do it. That's a spot that tends to get caught and torn as well. So let's take a look at how you can join the beginning and the ending of your bindings in a very simple process. Before long you'll be doing this with all your quilts. To join your binding strips with this method, you'll need to cut your binding to be about 20 inches longer than the full perimeter of your quilt. That will give you plenty to overlap your beginning and endings and enough room to work as you learn the process. You can cut that down a little bit once you become familiar with the steps involved in overlapping the corners and sewing a new seam together. For my quilt, I have cut my strips to a width of two and a half inches. When I fold that over, that will give me a binding width of one and a quarter. My finished binding strips then will produce a binding that is about a quarter of an inch wide when I wrap it around the edges of my quilt. Well, I have moved to the APQS classroom where I'm going to attach the binding to this small baby quilt. As a reminder, I have cut my binding strips two and a half inches wide and then I folded them in half and pressed them to give me a finished strip of one and a quarter inches. It's up to you in terms of whether you trim your quilt even with the edge and then attach the binding by aligning it up there or if you leave the batting and the backing in place, sew it on first and then trim the quilt down. Different schools of thought in terms of which is the best way. The important thing is that you do it the way that works best for you. Remember, I'm going to assume that you know how to handle the corners when you get there for the purpose of this tutorial. This is about joining up the end when we get all the way around to the other side of the particular binding. I will recommend that you use a walking foot if your machine isn't equipped with a built-in walking foot to help make sure that your binding doesn't shift as you attach it. So I'm going to start with my binding with this tail roughly about 10 inches hanging past. I'm going to align those edges and then I'm going to sew a quarter of an inch in from the raw edges, making my turns at the other side. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that you can see how I'm going to tackle that. Just so that you can see better through the video, I have not mounted a walking foot on my sewing machine right now, but again, I recommend that you do that if you don't have one available on your machine itself. I'm going to bring my bobbin thread up to the top. That way I can start fresh and I've aligned the edge of my foot next to the edge of the seam allowance. That's a quarter of an inch for this particular foot in this model of sewing machine. I'm going to back stitch a little bit where I begin and end my sewing here and again I've left a tail behind so that I can match when I come around with the other end of the binding. Well, just in case you aren't familiar with how to turn a corner and miter it with your binding, keep in mind that I'm taking a few shortcuts today to help show you how to get to the point of this video, which is joining your ends. But I may have normally pinned along my binding to help keep it from rippling and again used a walking foot. Let me show you how to approach the end of your binding and turn that corner with a miter. My foot does have a mark or a notch in it that represents a quarter of an inch from the needle ahead on the foot itself. I want to stop my sewing a quarter of an inch back from where my seam actually crosses. So I can use the visual mark on my foot or before I get there, I can take a peek and look where the seam is underneath or rather the edge of the quilt and then for reference purposes, add a pin right along that seam line. I could also measure back a quarter of an inch and place the pin here so that I would know to stop with my needle in line with the edge of the pin. The choice in how you approach that is up to you. Your goal is to stop a quarter of an inch away from the actual raw edge of the quilt that you see on the underside. Let me move that and continue down to the corner. 
I'll use the reference on my foot as a guide. When I get close, I'll often use the flywheel to help get it exactly where I want it to be. I'm now a quarter of an inch away from the seam line, back from that position. I'm going to use the reverse button on my machine to take a few back stitches. Then I'll lift the foot so we can see what we're going to do. Oh, I will need to raise my needle up. Lift the foot. And now, our goal is to create a 45 degree line with the fold of fabric right here, 45 degree line out from the actual corner, and then a very parallel or perfectly straight line where your binding raw edge aligns with the edge of the quilt once you've turned that corner. You can certainly take a bit more time than I'm doing here for the purposes of this tutorial. With a finger press there, I will then bring this back, see if I can get my fingers out of the way for you, and fold it back down the direction that I'm going to quilt. The important measurement here is that my fold line on this edge lines up exactly even with the line of the quilt or its edge coming down this direction. One more time. There's the mitered fold. I had stopped stitching a quarter of an inch in from the edge of my quilt. Fold it down the direction I intend to go. And make sure that my fold line is in line with the raw edge of the quilt coming this direction. You can then pin it, or I'll cheat a little bit right now and spin the quilt. And then start once more, one quarter of an inch in from the edge and so on down the rest of the way. Well, I'm coming to the end where my binding edges, beginning and ending pieces are overlapping each other. Now, I could actually stitch a little bit farther than that, but for the purpose of this tutorial, I want to make sure that I've got plenty so that you can see the process with me. I'm going to do just a couple of back stitches there to secure the binding before I handle these two edges together. Get my reverse button there. There we go. Now, of course, as Murphy's Law would have it, my ending strip is getting close to where I have a join. Let's see if I can show that to you. There we go. I've got a joining strip right here. And it almost looks like that's going to cause me trouble when I get these two together. Well, actually, I'm not really worried about that because it falls past the edge of my front or beginning strip far enough that I won't need to use that part. So here's the magic in making your first strip and your ending strip line up perfectly with a mitered intersection or seam. Do you remember at the beginning of the tutorial, I reminded you how wide I cut my binding strips? That's an important number. However wide you made your strips, whether it's two and a half inches, as mine was, or larger or smaller, the trick is to overlap your ending and beginning strips so that the beginning strip and the ending strip are that distance apart from each other. Let me move this out of the way a little bit more so that you can see. Here is my ending strip, right here. In fact, I'm going to put a little bit of a mark on the batting so that you can clearly see it in the video. Eh, maybe we can. Let's see. Well, it's a little bit better. Okay. That is actually where this strip is ending. Make sure it's nice and smooth all the way back. I don't want to pucker. I'm going to overlap this strip. I'll offset it a little bit so that you can still see, so that there's two and a half inches from this edge to the spot where I'm going to cut my 
current strip off. Let me get a ruler and show you how that's going to work. Okay, here's my bottom strip. Get my hand out of the way. For the purpose of the tutorial and so that you can see very clearly, I'll measure along. I got to turn it around so I can read the numbers. I'm going to turn it around and I'll put a mark out here in the seam allowance so that we can tell where that two and a half inches is. There's one inch, two inch, two and a half inches. Right there. You see that? Right there. So I will bring my top strip over the top and mark that in the exact same place. Now, of course, you're not going to want to use a Sharpie marker when you're doing this. You can use a pin. You can certainly fold it back, as I have here, and just create a fold so that you know where that's going to be cut off. I'll take my scissors now. You can see the mark underneath the previous one, holding it up there. And I'll cut the top strip off. Again, they're overlapping two and a half inches. That's because my binding is two and a half inches wide when it's open. You'll overlap that distance by the width of your binding. If you cut it an inch and a half, your overlap would be an inch and a half. Let's get that cut and see how this is going to work. Okay. So when I lay those nice and neat together, you can see that my mark is lined up. Maybe I can reach up and zoom in the camera just a little bit more so that you can see. That's a little better. There we go. So I now know that these two strips, once they're joined, are going to be the exact correct width for that to work out correctly. I'm going to take the thread out and we're going to spin the quilt and the binding around and crisscross those sections so that we can make that perfect corner, perfect intersection. I think I'll need to refocus the camera just a little, give us a little wider shot. I'm going to spin the quilt around and grab a hold of my two binding sections now and open them up. Now, of course, we're wanting to join these so that their right sides are together so that when we sew them, they'll fold the correct miter. So I'll open them with the right sides together and then take a little finagling to get the quilt in the right position. And a little fumbling. Of course, it's always when you're on camera that things don't go exactly according to plan. Here we go. Well, ultimately, my goal is to get those two lined up. Like this. So that the top and the bottom make an exact square. Just as so. You can just barely see my mark right down here. Now, of course, it would be a wise idea to take a pin or two to hold everything in place so that when you maneuver it under the foot, it'll stay in place. You will then sew from one corner across to the opposite corner and then open it up and you'll have a perfect edge. Now, I'm going to cheat a little bit and not use some pins so that this video doesn't get too long on you. And we'll see if we can't manipulate it around enough to get it in the camera angle and let you see how that's going to work out. So I'll overlap those again. Again, right sides are together for my binding strip. I guess with the solid color, it's kind of hard to tell that. Let's move that down and out of the way. Right sides are together. Let's get that foot down in the corner. And 
The foot is right now, use my scissors to point it out. The needle is right at that intersection where those two overlap each other, right at the top. I'll be sewing all the way across to this point. My extension plate happens to have a reference mark right here, so I can make sure that this point slides along that reference mark for a nice straight edge. Of course, if you're not confident you can do that, you can always mark that seam line. Well, let's sew that along here, see how we come out. I'll zoom in a little so you can get a better close-up look. Swing that around now that it's sewn together so that you can see we've gone from one corner, here we go, to the other corner. I'll find the camera. There it is. The last step will be to trim this extra piece off right here and then open it up and finger press it or press it with your iron. Now it does look when I first started it and laid it down, it wasn't quite exactly where I needed to be when I began. And of course, now that I've got it held together, I could go back and, and fix that mistake. And I probably should have pinned it for you, huh? But I, you know what? I think you're getting the idea. You're getting the idea. We'll make that straighten itself out just a little bit. There we go. Okay, so let's trim that up and open it up and see how it looks. We'll zoom out a little bit so you can get a better picture of that. Just a little bit. There we go. Cut my bobbin thread. There you can see my cheat. Yep, even the teacher sometimes has to cheat. Trim that down roughly to a quarter of an inch. And of course, I normally would pick out that mistake so that I could press this seam open and reduce the bulk. But to save some time, we'll just fold that over for now and finger press it so that we can see how it's going to look when we get it all joined together. So there is our join. When we lay it back down on our quilting, our quilt rather, in our space, and we start sewing it back together, it's amazing. It's all going to lay nice and flat. Take a look. Here we go. Look, no puckers. be sure to use your walking foot. I've got a little fold there because I don't have a walking foot on now for the purpose of this video. That would have made sure that that top layer didn't slide like the bottom. But now we've got a perfect join just as if we had sewn it on all the way around. That's how easy it is.